Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, get kicked off, and I'll do a quick uh, recap on the format. If you haven't been with me for the first several we've done today, these are very conversational in nature. They're aimed at a, a bit of a non-technical audience, somebody who's got a little more business concerns about some of this um, craziness that's going on around the NoSQL world. And speaking of crazy, we got a perfect guy in the role today, Godfrey Sullivan, who has become... Uh, not just a good partner of Datastacks, but um, has been a good good friend to me here recently and uh, got a lot to learn from a guy that's been around and seen as much success as, as Godfrey has. So we're, we're delighted to have him here on the panel today. Um, his background is, is really amazing, uh, coming from so many different companies and seeing the, the market from so many different perspectives that it's, uh, it's just going to be really special to hit him with. One of the hardest topics we're going to talk about actually today is this notion of what comes first, the application of the data. And inside of that, we're going we're to dive into a lot of the challenges around understanding the various technologies from a business perspective. So um, Godfrey, just before we get started, maybe just a, a quick little uh, in your own words sort of background of your journey to, to where you are today, hitting the highlights of the the various companies and roles you've, you've held would be fantastic. Hi, everybody. Uh, the reason I'm here is because I can eat more than Billy. And Don't believe it. And that, uh, Don't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your A game if you want to take him down. I'm telling you, that's, this right. is, that's some work. Um, so I spent, uh, started with Apple Computer back in 1981 when it was 500 people. I was there 11 years. Uh, it was about 15,000 people and about 7 billion by the time I left, so I had that wonderful experience of going from sort of startup to pretty good sized company and then uh, worked for Carol Bartz at Autodesk for eight years uh, and then uh, ran Hyperion for not quite seven years after that from 01 to 07 uh, when Oracle acquired us and then uh, have and been And what, what was the growth around that time? Well, so Apple went from 100 million to 7 billion, Autodesk went from 200 million to a little bit north of a billion Hyperion was about a half a billion dollar company that we took to a billion, but it was a half a billion headed the wrong way. Mm. That was a pretty tough period in 2001, just post 9-11. And then uh, Splunk I joined about five years ago. So it was, it was Tiny. small. <laughs> you see why I hang around him? <laughs> he, 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 I'm hoping to get some of that gravity uh, of that success uh, for sure. Well, you learn a lot that way, so. So when you look back over the course of your career where you've really um, held a lot of different roles and you've got to so – one thing I love about you as a CEO and, and I really do try and, and emulate is the amount of time you spend with customers and, and in the field. And, uh, not everybody does that at executive positions. And um, when you think about your knowledge of the data world as, as it exists today, obviously Splunk, but a little bit of Hyperion. Mm -hmm. What were some key moments in your careers and your various roles where, where you got, you know, particularly good insight into how businesses were really starting to leverage and value data? When did that happen, you know, kind of a timeline? Well, it hap happens in every com company and it happens with every product. So if you're out talking to customers on a regular basis, they'll, they'll and you hear enough of them, you'll pattern match off of it. So maybe just to give one example was back in the AutoCAD days, the strength of that company was the DWG file. So it was really... The, uh, you know, AutoCAD is just a graphical database that can take an XY coordinate from a database and, and turn it into something graphical on the computer. But the customers had a really strong appreciation of the data itself. So as we continue to move forward over the years, it was just data consistency was the only issue that we protected more than anything else. You could innovate as much as you wanted going from a file system to a graphical database or an object-oriented database. You could change from a command line to Windows. You could do anything you wanted as long as you kept the DWG file intact. So I think that if there's a learning over, over the years, it's that the data does matter and, and, and not having to redo it all the time or have data inconsistencies as you move forward, pretty important to the customer. So that, that was a specific case of there, there was a data that, that was an asset that was a known kind of quantity and structure. But now we've, we hear a lot about this uh, phrase that data is a, the new raw material. Mm -hmm. You know, it is to our era of business what the natural resources of the planet were to the industrial age. When, when you hear that, first of all, do you agree with that? And, and then if you do... What's the impact of that? Is it, is it something that will truly fundamentally change the world as much as raw materials changed the industrial world? Well, I can go both ways on this one. So uh, the, the good thing that happened over the last 10 years is that devices of all kinds 
got smarter, both about how they could communicate with each other, and a lot of them became wireless. So, you know, when I meet with CIOs, and I, if I say big data, which I don't say very much, but if, you, if the big data term comes up, most CIOs roll their eyes and say, I'm so tired of hearing that term, my data was always big. And so, and they're really kind of skeptical about it, and then, so the conversation we get into is, what happened? What was the relevant thing that caused people to start waving their arms and saying data got big? And the re the couple of things happened. The internet transaction activity exploded. Uh, another thing is that wireless came along, so devices that could normally not have communicated with each other, you know, a thermostat went from a dumb thermostat with a dial to a smart meter that can tr wirelessly transmit its output all the time. Uh, you and I went from, you know, shopping at Nordstrom's, or, well, you guys don't look like you shop at Nordstrom's. Let's see. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That, I don't either. So the, but the, um, you know, went from a physical activity where we would walk down the aisles and, you know, look at 50 products and buy a belt, and the only thing that goes into the point of sale system, the only thing that goes into the ERP or the data warehouse is that quantity one, part number, update your file record, your customer record. Do that same experience on the internet online. Every time you click on a URL, you guys know what happens, right? A whole series of machine events get fired off, whether it's from the server or the routers, the networks, firewalls, et cetera, mobile. And so that was, it was really the internet coming of age, mobile, devices got smarter and were able to transmit their behavior. That's what caused data to, volumes to explode. So to the extent that we have some joint customers who are pretty happy using Splunk and also pretty happy using Cassandra, it's because the data volumes and the variability of that data exploded. If it was just the same old row and column schema, a relational database could handle that, but it was really that sort of explosion in device types and data types and uh, inconsistent formats and all that. That's what's caused the, this thing to, to explode. I think when I have got that conversation with the CIO, they go, yeah, I got it, I, I can accept that. Now we're back to what's the business problem. Right. It's interesting because many analysts and journalists have referred to Splunk as the first successful big data company. And mm -hmm. they say you guys were doing big data before the, the term was coined. Yet you do. You, you very intentionally avoid using that phrase. It just it doesn't come out of your mouth very often. Why are you so adamant about not using that, that phrase? Well, it's pretty funny. You, you know, the, if you get sideswiped by a marketing term, you can ride the wave while it's hot and you can just easy, easily fall off the wave as soon as it's not hot. <laughs> so I think it was Svetlana, the lady who's a pretty smart analyst at Gartner, who recently wrote to say that the, you know, the big wave, the, the big data wave has now reached its trough of dis disillusionment, and, and uh, specifically in terms of the number of people who are out there doing something in Hadoop and being unsuccessful with it. And so, and she said the only big data company that's successful truly is Splunk. Well, what did that actually mean? And all it means to me is that don't, don't get caught up in a hype cycle. The question is, what's the business problem? And in our case, we're very careful about our core product positioning. So we talk about Splunk being an engine for machine data, not an engine for big data. Ours is, you know, that's where we add value. And Splunk isn't for everything any more than Cassandra's not for everything. But you need to be specific about what you claim. You need to be specific about where you add value. And where we add real value is in device-generated data, machine-generated data. Uh, that's that's kind of where we live. So, so when the whole big data term came along, we were we were good with it because if it helped us have more success and and more visibility and all the stuff that comes with a hype cycle, we'll take it. But you don't want to get on that wave if that's not where your your core product positioning is. So it's been a pretty ex interesting lesson for our whole company in terms of being true to what you are and not got, getting caught up in a in a hype cycle. I, I think there's a lesson there for all businesses actually around not just doing something because it's the, we, we talked earlier in one of our sessions about the shiny new object problem. And I think what you're trying to say is, okay, if I buy into this concept that data is the next new raw material, that, that doesn't mean I just start saying, great, I need a big data problem. You're still saying to companies, what's your business problem? I hear you say that over and over and over again. And if the business problem happens to have scale issues that merit Cassandra, then great. But is that how you counsel people when you go in? And second part to that question is, with whom does your conversation tend to resonate the most? You talk to some pretty high-level people, but you also talk to some lower-level, director-level people, and even engineers. Everybody. So when you're out with your customers and you're trying to get them to understand uh, this notion of what's your business problem before you tell me you have a data problem, with whom does that resonate the most when you see a company doing it right? Yeah. Huh. 
Okay, so when I, when I meet with a C-level exec, they're not quite so concerned about what the, what the data issues are. They just want to solve a problem because they only fund, to the extent that they have scarce resources called people and money, they only want to put people and money against a problem that has a, a tangible ROI. Mm -hmm. So it's rare that I would have a purely technological, technological conversation with a C-level executive. Mostly it's an applied math. It's, it's what is the problem? Is there an equal statement on the other side that call, that's called ROI? When we're talking to departmental users, our sysadmins who are our core users and the like, they're typically dealing with a data problem trying to solve that business requirement. So I think you have to be able to walk on both sides of the street. I don't think it's just one or the other. Uh, but this new generation of data, just to take me machine data as one example, but the fact that that data exploded creates opportunity that never existed before. So until technologies came along that could analyze semi-structured or unstructured or variable structured data at volume, you never thought about being able to access that and get value out of it. But nowadays you can get enormous amounts of value out of clickstream data. So good. So for, you know, at our level, at the working level, we need to understand those data types and where is the gold that's in that data? How can I go get that? You may not know that, what the value is. At the, at the exec level, they just need pictures, right? They don't understand text so much. Yeah, and that's, that's true though, because one of our earlier sessions was a, was a very long discussion around the, um, the divides that happen in organizations around the IT department in particular and the line of business. And we had a whole hour long discussion around that friction. And I think one of the things you're saying is actually a good antidote to that problem, which is if we start with the business problem, mm -hmm. instead of focusing on the technology first or the data first, then I think right. we've got a better shot uh, to kind of get out and get going. Well, just you know, for all of you, so the COO of a major European car company is in to see us about six months ago. And we had done a project with them where we were analyzing all, all the log files that are being generated by the electric cars. So you guys know all how that works. The cars are generating data. It's a log file of some kind. Cellular transmission capability in the car. Send the data back to headquarters. So we put all that, consolidated it down, 5,000 cars, consolidate all the input wirelessly into a, into a server, analyze it, and Splunk. So we show them what they came for, which was, here's how many cars got a charge, here's where they were, here's the percentage, was the amperage correct, all the sort of operational stuff that's in a log. But if you're looking at the data with an open mind, you'll be looking for, is there some other thing that wasn't actually part of the ROI, it wasn't part of the case study, the execs didn't have a clue. We just added up the beginning and ending timestamps of the cellular trans transmission itself, aggregated that, the sum of that was about $2 million a month more than they had contracted with Orange for the cell capacity. So accident, just being curious about the data and looking at it for what it could be purposed for, that's a data conversation. And we gave them a $2 million accidental ROI during the POC. So I think the people, you know, all of us who work with data need to be curious about that data because there's, there's information in there that may not be a part of that other side of that ROI equation. So being curious is pretty important. So that brings up a very interesting uh, dilemma, which is actually the topic of today's discussion, which came first, the data or the application. Mm -hmm. And th I, I wanna read to you an, a, an actual conversation I had with an executive, smart executive. I don't mean to belittle the person, but um, we, we got into the discussion and I said, so- Smart executive is kind of an oxymoron, but we'll continue. It is. Go ahead Re with the example. Relatively yeah, yeah. speaking, <laughs> we'll, we'll say, relatively speaking. So the conversation was, I asked the company, I said, so, what is your company's big data strategy at the moment? Because the whole point of me coming was to talk about big data and I wanted to know where they were first. The response was, oh, we have a team who has started to implement Hadoop. I said, to do what? And they said, for our big data. And I said, right, but in what respect? What are you doing with that data? And they said, well, that's gonna help drive down our costs. I said, costs of what? Big data. <laughs> Literally, that was the exchange. And when you and I talked, you said, unfortunately, that's a conversation you've heard as well. So what's wrong with that picture? We feel like there's something inherently wrong with that discussion. But what you said earlier about, around being curious, isn't that what they're doing? Isn't they just saying, hey, well, let's just create a Hadoop cluster and capture everything? Isn't that being curious? Where's the difference between you know, being reckless and, and, and directionless versus being curious. Because yeah, yeah. I think if you can help us understand that, that is a f fundamental problem right now in this whole world of advancing beyond relational databases and what we do with this data. Well, 
I spend about half of my time on the road. So the good news about that is you get just enough customer visits where you hear some funny stories. And one of them, I guess if I were rewinding the tape to last year, I couldn't count the number of customer conversations where I, somebody said, oh, I'm standing up a 20-node Hadoop cluster. Great. What are you doing it for? Well, to put our data in there. OK. What do you plan to do with it? I don't know yet, but we're putting all of our data in Hadoop. So, or Cassandra, you hear that from time to time. Your guys were a little bit more purposeful, so I, I, you didn't get quite the, quite the, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, the wiping of the paintbrush on that. But, but the, hear, heard all the time. This year, it's very different, which is those same customers are coming back to us saying, "Can you help us get some value out of that data?" It was hard to get the data out. We had to get a data scientist to come in and write some map, you know, map reduce jobs, and all of a sudden, it turns into a more difficult proposition. So if there's any difference, and I can tell you that it, I've had at least five CIO level conversations in the last two months where they basically said, we put a pause on, we hit the pause button on that, we're going back and doing a business reality check to say what is it we're trying to achieve because it becomes yet one more cost center, one more set of hardware to provision, one more set of things to make sure you have secure, security's not great there. I mean, there's a lot, yeah. of, there's a lot of operational systems things that come, come along with that. So I'd say that a year ago it was just put the data in there and this year it's much more back to the business problem, which is what are we trying to solve and apply the appropriate technology to that business problem, which might or might not be, you know, any particular name. But, but you did say be curious. Mm -hmm. And so isn't it, isn't it good for me to go out and say, okay, great, I'm just going to go ahead and collect everything and I'm going to go out and be curious. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but there's an element of truth to that. And unfortunately though, we're not seeing the yield mm -hmm. as you said, and by the way, you're not alone in that many analysts have, have written about that very same thing. So mm -hmm. What's the, what's the balancing act that a company has to do? You're talking to a lot of people here who run lines of businesses. They run their own companies. Um, they're really struggling with how do I become competitively uh, agile and flexible and aggressive, but they don't want to waste money and time. And unfortunately, that's what we've seen a lot of in the past couple of years. Yeah. What's the balance? Uh, you know, if you're a big enough company, you should always have some measure of resources allocated to people to go do exploration. Even a company of our size will have a few people in development who are not connected to a current product roadmap and you just want them to go out and look at future architectures, future technologies, be looking for that next thing. So you can't have everything be just around production of, of so we all need to keep our innovation dollars at, at play. So some amount of exploration for that sake is probably okay, but, but you, you want that to be a fraction of the whole, not, not a big portion of the whole. Uh, where, where I really see it is is really what you're doing with this conference. So one of the things we do that's most successful for us, we do Splunk Lives all over the world. We do a, a customer event probably once or twice a week somewhere in the world, and we just invite our customers, and then we have other customers do presentations to them, and we buy the coffee and stay out of the way. That sharing of use cases, that sharing of successful stories is where, they are, where imagination meets the ROI. So one of the a large industrial conglomerate, conglomerate out of Japan comes in to see us, and we had never even thought of it, but they decided to index their elevator data. They had, they had been to one of our Splunk Lives, got the idea by looking at how you could search log files, and they decided, okay, you know, card access to an elevator computer, index all that stuff. They've got 100,000 elevators under management across Japan, and guess what they found? That there was a direct correlation between activity, foot traffic to a suite, and its probability of the lease being renewed or not. So uh, there, was, there was operational intelligence in the elevator log, but they would have never discovered that had they not had the, you know, that sort of imagination sparked by another customer. So I think it's okay. It's, it's best to be curious. That's a good example of being curious, yeah. but also seeing some tangible evidence from other customers to give you some uh, map to follow. I think the whole magic of these conferences is exactly that. You, you folks are all hearing some other customer explain the benefit that they've achieved. Cheat, you know, it's what I did in school. But look, <laughs> oh, sorry, look, but you know, look over somebody's shoulder and see what you can learn because you'll get to the finish line a lot faster and save yourself a lot of pain. So, so along that lines and of- When I took basic, if that girl who sat next to me had applied herself, I might have had a different career. So this yeah. was, I've never forgiven her for that. Was, I played college football, so I didn't have to study. I got my <laughs> tests in advance. Uh, so we had, uh, you guys will get that later. <laughs> so we had, um, no, we were at Louisville, not, not Oklahoma, so we were all right. Um, 
learning a little bit from other people, doing that little bit of cheating, you, you've had a very unique experience, I think, because you've been on the analytics side with Hyperion. Mm -hmm. And then now you're on this other side of the world where you are this aggregator and capturer of the data. But yet, you guys do turn around. One of the, right or wrong, one of the things I've always admired about uh, Splunk, when I was at my last company, Quest Software, we, we looked at these guys a lot and what they were doing. And um, I always felt like you guys were an application. Mm -hmm. And that differentiated Splunk in my eyes because, and by application I mean there was a targeted user who got very specific and helpful and actionable information mm -hmm. from the interface, right? So we're infrastructure, okay? So Cassandra is an infrastructure component on which you can write applications, but mm -hmm. we in and of ourselves are not an application. Mm -hmm. So is that a fair characterization of Splunk? Is it, is it an application? Is it more? I'm sure you've had people try and push you to become a generic store, mm -hmm. but as you're trying to help solve people's problems, where do you put your focus? And this is going to lead into this notion of app versus data, which comes first. Mm -hmm. we, don't, uh, we don't put our, our focus on the data store piece of it. Uh, just the unique characteristic of it is that data has a, you know, a radioactive half-life for us that's about 30 to 60 days. That's where the real value is, fresh data coming off of sensors or devices of some kind, servers, and, and that data is actionable for us in that period of time because it's usually about something going on either in security, IT operations, something about whether an application is behaving correctly. Um, so once that data has reached its sort of near-term potential, then most of our customers want to move it out of the index and into some sort of store. So they want to move it into a, few of them would move it into a relational database, but a lot of them would move it into some, you know, like cheap batch storage. They move it in Hadoop, they move it somewhere. But, but you just wouldn't want to keep, uh, why, why slow your index down by having too much time in it? So that's how we typically do it. We don't, we don't put a lot of our engineering resources around the data store side of it. We think of Splunk. When you, think, when you use Google, you don't think about where the data store is. You just yeah. know that you can type in some Boolean string and get an answer back. And the way our users use Splunk, it's the same thing. They're, they're building a query that's, that's a, basically, a, you know, it's like a SQL operation, but it's our own search language. And they're getting an answer back. Show me what happened at this period of time with this customer, with that event. And they get the answer back. So it feels mo more like an application. Yeah. And you don't, as a user, really need to know so much about where it got stored. So combining your experience from the Hyperion times and, and the Splunk times, what are the biggest inhibitors to success mm -hmm. for working with data that you've seen happen in companies? And this could be organizational, it could be technological. We spent a lot of time talking about is the technology the problem or the right. people the problem? Right. Um, what are some of the things where if you were to share some, some lessons learned on things that went wrong, what, what would be some big highlights you would want to hit there? Well, let's just take Splunk. So, you know, we went from very small company to IPO last year, and we'll, you know, analysts say we'll do, you know, somewhere between 275 and 300 million this year, almost 6,000 customers worldwide. The hard thing about running Splunk is deciding what not to do. So, when you have customers come in that say, here, I just index my elevator data, and somebody says, gee, I just index this information off our electric cars, you can chase that next <laughs> shiny object. You know, yep. that's the real problem. So we try to stay focused around what, what do we need to do on a roadmap basis, development basis, that helps most of the customers most of the time and, and stay focused with that. Because the edge cases come our way all the time and they're really interesting, but it's not our business. You know, McKinney's is running around, building systems company, running around uh, the southeast right now speaking at our conferences, talking about how they're taking uh, sensor data from 20,000 different monitoring systems, you know, thermostats and card keys accesses into buildings at Elgin Air Force Base, and they've cut the electric bills down there by almost a million dollars a month. Wow. It's good stuff, but we're not in the building systems monitoring business. So great story, but not something you can get distracted by. We need to stay focused on the core things about how do you get more data sources in? How do you analyze it better? How do you improve system performance? How do you build ODBC drivers so that you can support other visualization techniques? So we really concentrate on how do we make that user experience better, and how do we make it easier you know, and better performance and it's always about what not to do. And so even in large same, companies same who are trying that. to figure out, you know, this, this new path to success, staying focused, picking your battles, yep. and then sufficiently staffing them. Yeah. yeah. We, we've seen um, already in our, you know, order of magnitude difference in the size of our companies, 300 customers and, and growing. But that's enough data to start drawing some conclusions. And what mm -hmm. we see a lot of times is um, a, a starvation of a team because they are trying to do too much. 
innovation is okay, but in, too much innovation where you don't allow anybody to succeed is, is one of our biggest challenges that we see is that they don't give the team enough, whether it be time or budget or, or what have you, it's almost like they set them up to fail mm -hmm. from the get-go. So let's flip that now. Um, companies who have done great things with data and have kind of reinvented themselves that you guys have seen and you've got, like you said, hundreds and hundreds of use cases that you probably know personally, but if you were going to try and normalize that into some principles, what are the companies doing right who are figuring out how to leverage this data in, in ways that are literally transforming their business? Uh, the, uh, the feedback I get uh, most often from, from CIO levels and VPs of development who have been sorting out this problem is where they used to maybe think that there could be one answer or two answers because every, you know, consolidation, you know how this thing goes in the data warehouse world where there was sort of all these data marts and then everybody oh, yeah. said we'll have a master data warehouse project and a bunch of people died along the way to that finish line. Yep. Then the pendulum swung back the other way and now we're starting to see data marts again. There's a, there's a balance in there somewhere. There's no, no perfect answer, but what I'm hearing is just sort of a, everybody's breathing a sigh of relief because it's normalizing there, saying, okay, uh, you know, Cassandra, good for OLTP. When you have need fast read-write operations for mission-critical uh, customer-facing application, perfect technology to apply. You wouldn't apply a technology that's, uh, you know, a Hadoop for that. You would, okay, cheap batch storage. We'll use that. So people are beginning to sort of normalize and sort out this technology does a great job at solving that category of problem. And that's kind of what we're seeing, and, and it's actually a good that, that there's a little bit less drama around it now, and, and sort of normalization of thought and conversation is taking over. And so we look at it and say, well, we need to be good citizens with all those, all those store, all the uh, data stores, mm -hmm. and be a good infrastructure layer in that, so we have actually, uh, might as well introduce really quickly, Eddie Satterley. Eddie, stand up, turn around so you can see who you are. Eddie is on the Cassandra Advisory Council and is our liaison to DataStax in terms of helping work on how to make DataStax and Splunk work better together because even though right now a lot of our customers, you have these monster customers, a lot of times that's over in the app dev side and we're over in operations. But now people are starting to ask the question, gee, I wonder if Splunk could give me some visibility into that data and we have a few customers who are pressing us hard on that. So I don't know if that's the answer to your question, but I kind of look at it and say, being good technology citizens and knowing where those use cases are where we support each other, that's where the, that's where the benefit comes out. Yeah, from a customer standpoint, I think it's, it, what, it, what it really derives is it's, it's maximizing that data. One, one thing that, that Splunk does that's interesting is um, in their model, you, you pay for the data, right? So one thing that, that Godfrey was really big on in the vision was once you've done that, that data can be repurposed mm -hmm. for many different people inside the organization, and you're opening up a whole new world of audiences to the same data, mm -hmm. right? So I think companies that are taking that broader view of how to leverage that data are very successful, at least we see that in our world as well, where we, we are playing with other technologies in, in really meaningful ways. So, but unfortunately, and this was exposed a lot in a couple of other sessions, um, the the age-old political problems in organizations sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, inhibit that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's I think vendors can help that a little bit by sharing use cases and finding internal champions, but th that is a very real problem sometimes is the internal politics of a company stop their progress just because of basic fundamental human things, not technological things. How many of you work in the security department of your companies? Anybody here work in the security department? You're all in, in the development world. So good, I can pick on the security people. Okay, <laughs> so this is a good example of where when Splunk goes in, sometimes we go in IT operations, sometimes the VP of Enterprise Apps is bringing us in, yep. sometimes the CISO. It's so not uncommon when we go in first to a security or operation, we get stuck there for a while. So we say, oh, we're, a, you know, we're an agnostic data platform, just put all your event data into Splunk and then each of the departments can use it and all of you could get benefit. The more you put in, the more departments can get cross-level cross benefits out of it. The security guys are the most guilty of having their own secret language and secret handshake mm -hmm. and all yeah. that stuff and they don't really want the other departments to see their data and they've only had siloed tools so they're not used to sharing technologies with other departments. So it's a good example of I guess the point I'm trying to make for all of you is communicate with your colleagues what you're working on because what the, the natural human order is to get focused on what you're doing and then not share it with anybody. And I think for you folks, maybe the thing that could help the most 
is for the development teams to be out talk and the apps teams to be out talking to other parts of the organization, making yeah. sure that they know what you're working on and what you're doing. Because I find all too often it's those departmental, it's the, it's the org chart silo yeah. in companies that slows things down, not the technologies. It's about human behavior, and we all get busy and and don't communicate across boundaries. So yeah. I would I would just encourage all of you make sure you're you're communicating to the other parts of the organization what you're working on. We, we talked about this morning in my keynote moving from Trailblazer to Ambassador. Mm -hmm. You know, you, mm -hmm. you spend a, a good bit of your time now really cutting new ground but now it's time to go and share that. So I want to come back to something you said earlier where you talked about, um, you touched around it, you didn't use the word about standards. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about that a little bit today, but I'm really interested to hear your take on this again because of the uh, experience you had in the BI world where there was mm -hmm. such a diversity of use cases and people and teams, mm -hmm. uh, some inside of IT, some not inside of IT and now you're sort of in the same boat because you're dealing with not just systems people, but you're moving out of the data center with Splunk even. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on standards? Are they a necessary evil? Are they sometimes to be relaxed when we're in these paradigm shifting moments like we are right now where you know, we're finding new and exciting uses for these new technologies? Um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? And how much should, should our audience be focused on standardizing this stuff, or do we let it run wild for a while, or are we too young for standards right now in this new space? Volume sets standards. Committees don't set standards. U user adoption and volume is what sets standards. So it's, we could all hope that our thing becomes a standard, but that's not how it works. Customers behave, you guys like what you like, and volume sets standards. So, and standards will happen just because things become more popular, especially in technology. Consolidation happens more quickly in technology than other, other places because as, as it becomes popular, it's a lot easier to do what someone else has done that worked than for everybody to recreate the thing. But we don't spend any time internally thinking about standards per se because we really just believe if you give people a product that they like to use and you make it more enjoyable for more people, standardization will happen as an outcome. So I always think of standardization as an outcome, not as a driver. Mm. And, and to your point about should you just let the Wild West happen? Probably for now, you know. In, in the case of Cassandra, it's such, so young in terms of, of where it's going. You may have 300 customers, but they're huge customers doing massive mission critical activity. And as that starts to spread, then the standardization just comes with it. So it's almost like it's you're describing, I, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but there's a story of, uh, you know, on a campus and stay off the grass signs. Mm -hmm. That's the standard. But then you see these paths keep getting worn in the grass. <laughs> and so you just put a sidewalk there. Like that, that's the smartest way to do that. Mm -hmm. Once you see where the people are walking, that's right. then you put the sidewalk in mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to plan where the people are going to walk. I think that's a great way to look about it. Mm -hmm. we, we really haven't had that perspective today as we talked about it, but I think that that is very true. Standards will emerge over time. We talked about the, the old era back in the mainframe transition days when people were moving off the mainframe. In, in my era where I was developing apps in client server, um, nobody was happy about that. I mean, nobody, let's say, nobody in the standards teams were happy about that mm -hmm. at all. But look where the world ended up. Well, I saw your press release today where uh, Oyala and Netflix yeah. and uh, OpenWave Open Wave yeah. all talked about having moved off of an RDBMS and, and onto the uh, Cassandra system. And so it's just a good example of that those, those RDBs were good for their use cases and at that moment in time for that. And in this new generation of data, there are some other technologies that make more sense. So those use cases like that are what help, helps everyone move. So I just think this conference and the more use cases, I've got a project underway in the company right now that we call the book. And of course, in the world these days, it's not a physical book as much as it is a URL on a website. But we're really just trying to document as many use cases as we can, detailed use cases. Start with the business problem, what was the ROI and the outcome, now let's get inside and let's look at what were the data sources, what were the correlations, what searches did you have to run, how, what were the problems? Let's, it may be a 20-page case study, not mm. the two-page brochure, but help more and more customers learn from the other customers as quickly as possible. So I think there's a, in the mission-critical software category, there's, there's an enterprise level of viral. There's an enterprise version of viral yeah. that's different than what we think of in the consumer worlds, and it's mostly about communicating technically accurate information to as many people as possible. So I think that part of that, you know, it's, it's not just the rodeo, but it's about 
communication. I thought that press release today was a perfect example of what the mission, the, the enterprise version of viral is all about. Yeah, you know what's great about that is, and this is a tough spot for a lot of you guys who are customers because a lot of our customers won't talk about what they're doing because they do feel like they have a competitive advantage right now. And, and they don't want the world to necessarily know what they're doing with this stuff, but it, then they run into hiring problems at the same time. So one of our biggest challenges in the world right now has nothing to do with the technology, it's the ecosystem. We, we need more people who understand this stuff. And so I think when they see companies like, like you guys and us doing partnerships and the work Eddie's doing and the, the way that we share with the community, we have a vehicle to really educate a lot of people that never existed before in my era. You know, this open source stuff and the ability for people to communicate is fantastic. So we should all hopefully try and find ways to take advantage of that and then maybe contribute back a little bit, which yeah. I think is a, yeah. a good concept to have. So if we think back, here we are, 2013 for posterity, we're on video. Um, let's go back 2008 and describe for us the world in 2008 when somebody said big data. Like what, what, was the, what were people grappling with and trying to understand five years ago? Well, nobody said that to me five years ago, so it's hard to come up with a data point for that. Uh, I had just joined Splunk five years ago, and so uh, the thing that was, if there was a, a notion of big data then, is, in fact, if I just think about during the year between uh, the time I left Hyperion slash Oracle and joined Splunk, I spent a lot of time, I got to know the Splunk company sort of by accident, I spent a lot of time on the phone with customers. And what I noticed was the if there was a pattern to recognize, it was how the diversity of use cases across all those customers. Yeah, yeah. And so that was what sort of alerted me to the fact that Splunk was kind of a, 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 a mini data indexing engine, which was so, what sort of made it so fascinating. But I, you know, nobody was talking about big data. In my world at that time, nobody was talking about big data. They were talking about a specific problem to solve. I'm trying to do security analytics. I'm trying to so, you know, reduce mean time to identify a problem uh, from an app that fell down or my infrastructure or something like that. It was pretty early days back then, so I can't say that, uh, so the that word, question didn't come my way. The word Hadoop was starting to emerge right around that time. I mean, it was mm -hmm. obviously it's a third, about a 10-year-old project right now right. if you go way back to Google, but right. I'd say it, from my experience, my first introduction to it was back in 2007, 2008 when I was at Quest. Mm -hmm. And at Quest, we did heterogeneous, my particular division was databases, so we did uh, database lifecycle management with tools. So it was very important to us to pick up on new trends that were happening with, with database technologies, and we heard this term called Hadoop. I thought it was a stupid name, which meant it must have been open source, because it seems like you have to name open source projects with really stupid names. Yeah. So Hadoop was this name that was out there. We decided to take a look at it and kind of decide what it was, and we really couldn't figure it out at the time. Like, we, we sort of knew what the technology did, but um, when was your first kind of awareness of this concept of Hadoop entering into the mainstream of your customer base? What year do you think that happened? Probably 2010 is when we started to see it more, yeah. So now as you think about, like you said, things settling down, 2010 is the first time you heard it. We're in 13 now. Mm -hmm. Let's go out to uh, pull out your crystal ball. Let's think about three to five years. Mm -hmm. What, what does the big data landscape, and I know you don't like the word big data, let's say it like this, What's right. the data, what does the data store landscape mm -hmm. in your complete just estimation, what's it look like in three to five years? Is it cleaner? Is it messier? Is, is it consolidated? What, what do you think it looks like? It'll just be a little different. You know, their data will have exploded. So with these data volumes that are rising, what is every, everything that we all read says data, data volumes are growing by 50% per year. And a lot of that's the click stream, the machine generated data. Mm -hmm. these, these data volumes will continue to explode. It's not necessary to capture everything that ever happened. So there'll be some normalization around what's important and what's not. Um, there'll be, uh, the technologies will have started to sort themselves out. So relational databases that, that serve good old fashioned schema based read write operations, they'll be just sitting right there doing really what they do quite well. The, OLTP guys, you guys will be handling all that high speed read write stuff. The cheap batch guys will be handling stuff that's at rest and we'll be off doing time based indexing. You know, so I mean, it's a, to the extent that the, I think the marketplace will normalize itself a little bit because you have these, these disruptive, you know, this, this discontinuity created by one of these new, new uh, technologies coming online. That's, that's terrific. But it, the, 
you know, the pendulum swings. It goes through phases of disruption and phase of normalcy. I think we're actually starting to move into a phase of normalcy. Yeah. And so to, you know, when Gartner talks about their hype cycle and they talk about Hadoop being in the trough of disillusionment, that's only temporary. That'll be a phase and it'll come back out and you'll start seeing it and then people will say, oh, it's really good at this thing. And it'll right. get applied to that thing over and over and over again. So, you know, we'll see it, we'll see it all start to normalize, you know, and then there'll be some other disruptive thing comes along and you and I'll be out of work and we'll be off looking for something else to do. So That's right. Yeah, I think that it'll be, I, I, I think that right now it's the, uh, the thing that's most frustrating to me at the moment is the misapplication of technology. Mm -hmm. we, we see a lot of wasted time and effort and money in organizations because they didn't stop to think about what am I trying to accomplish here from a business perspective? And they just sort of run off and rush off and, and say, well, this is the buzzword, so I need more of this. And it doesn't matter what that is. It could be us, it could be a dupe, it could be any technology. But I think what happens over the next three to five years is because of conferences like this and more education is people do get a lot smarter about, oh yeah, that's what I'm trying to solve. Hey, this does that really, really well. And hopefully in five years, what I think will happen is what we're doing today together as companies will we'll only get better and there will be more integration mm -hmm. among the various technologies. I think that will be the real home run when companies can start to weave all these different disparate data systems together into a more holistic view and, and kind of bring them into you know, focus. So how many of you have a Hadoop cluster of some kind at your shop? How many, come on guys, you can raise your hands. It's okay, like they don't have, this isn't the NSA. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, so, and, and do you feel like, I'll probably get some head nods or something, but do you feel like your company is beginning to understand when you would use Hadoop versus when you would use a, a technology like Cassandra? You think you guys are starting to sort that out? It'll normalize. Yep, and, and, and that's where I think the executives can play a big role is, is forcing their teams to say, Come on, guys, I know there's not a one-size-fits-all for this mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Bring me the use cases, bring me the data. And that's one way to really clear this noise is yeah. get real use cases with stuff. That yep. Yep. drives me crazy when people say, uh, when, I, when I was at Quest, we used to look at a lot of different database technologies, and there was you know, XDB, YDB, ZDB, I call them fill-in-the-blank fill DB. Like, they were coming out every week, it seemed. And I, I said, you know what, until you bring me 10 real-life use cases, I can't even begin to answer. I'm not gonna answer their marketing because all the marketing sounds identical. So mm -hmm. get the use cases and kind of figure out where all that stuff fits. So um, I'm gonna bring up one more question and then we'll take some questions from you guys if you have a couple questions for Godfrey. But um, tangential to what we're talking about here and I didn't prep you for this one so this is on the hot seat. But you mentioned NSA and that is a kind of a big hot button obviously in the news right now around security. Um, we both work in, in companies where we, are helping organizations capture more and more and more data about people. What is the expectation of the average individual? Should just we just assume, like Scott McNeely said many years ago, you have no privacy? I mean, yeah. What do you think about Scott all that based was, on the world know, we're Scott in? Scott was right. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we'd love to have. I think all of us have a protective side of us that wants our privacy and for our families and all the rest of that, and we deserve to feel that way. But in the digital world, as soon as you log on. Somebody knows what you're doing. You know, it doesn't take much at work to look at the blue coat logs and know where all your, where all your people are <laughs> surfing. And yet, you ask most customers, most employees, they have no idea that IT can see every single that's place true. they go. Yep, they don't. It's, that's, Even today, that, they don't. That horse is so far out of the barn. Uh, you know, when you walk around the streets of London, all you have to do is look up instead of looking down. You know, all, this, all the things say look right or look left when you step off the curb so you don't get run over by a bus. Yeah. If you look up, there's a camera. So you, you can't walk around London without your picture being captured in a thousand different files. So in this electronic age, uh, amazing how much of our activity is known to someone. Yeah. So we have a cable company customer that, that in, they have Splunk out on all the set-top boxes. And so it's out there indexing all the log files of every click you make on your remote control. You don't need to be concerned about it necessarily. They anonymize the names and the account numbers when the data comes back, but they can see by neighborhood, by zip code, down to individual address what your preferences are. So if you like to watch old Western movies 
and you watch them over and over again, and someday your television comes up and shows you a, a list of all the, the old classic westerns that are for you know a special three ninety nine tonight and tonight only, and you wonder how in the hell did they know I like old westerns, <laughs> or whatever else it is you watch. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> sports or something. Yeah. <laughs> Point being. It's all out there, it's in the logs. It's somewhere out there is a machine event with your IP address, your telephone number, whatever it is, your key phone ID, whatever it is, it's all out there and somebody can analyze it. And I can promise you, talking to the C-level uh, execs at the telephone companies, they are all trying to figure out how to create a competitive advantage yeah. out of that data. Yep. They're all very concerned about privacy rights because they are the ones who will get sued. I think we have less, to, less concern with with uh, business, actually, than with governments. Yeah. I would say we shouldn't trust the governments of any company, any country, including our own. We should probably worry about that a little bit more. I think from a company side, there's so much governance and so much diligence applied, and the reputation risk of, of that kind of a mistake is so egregious that uh, we have less to worry about on the, on the company side. I think it's a generational thing too. I, I know my daughters are, I have a 15, 13 and nine year old and uh, they are not gonna grow up with any privacy expectations. Mm -hmm. They just don't, mm -hmm. I mean their world right now, I always tell them, if the product is free, you're the product. Yeah. You just better figure that out mm -hmm. early, right? Yeah. So there's nothing free. So if it's free, you are the product in, in question. So it is a different world and, and, and because of that, I think, because of the generational shift in mentality, all of your companies better be thinking about how you can capture more and more to change that experience because my daughters will care more about experience than privacy. And so what today we look at from these telcos and say, woo, that's kind of invasive, I don't like them doing that. My daughters are gonna say, this company sucks. Like I can't believe they don't do X, Y, and Z. They won't care that it's because of all their data. And hey, I think that's a generational thing. Anybody here own a Tesla? Any Tesla hands? There's a couple. So I have one. When you love it. When you sign a contract to buy that car, there's a paragraph in that contract where you actually sign away your digital rights to your log data. So all of you remember when the New York Times author wrote that scathing article about the Tesla and then Elon Musk published the log files. And when the writer was saying I was only going 45 miles an hour <laughs> over this period of time, he said, nope, log, right here in the log files is going 85 miles an hour for two hours. <laughs> Bummer, dude, the truth's right there in the logs. So. So he blew that guy right out of the water. It was the empirical version of the truth. No disputing what's in the logs, unless, you, well, you know, you know what I mean. It's just like, it, it is what it is. So when you buy a Tesla, you sign away the fact that they can read your log files because it's part of their overall product experience and yeah. it's because they are trying to give you a better customer experience. So you're actually not only signing away the logs, but you're actually signing away your location information. Okay, now in, in Europe, the difference is the laws are such that when you buy the electric car I talked about earlier that's sending out its log file, you actually have not yet signed away your location information. So we could show them where the car was. We could gather the X, Y coordinates. We could show them where the car was. We could show them a, a Google map mat, or mashup to show them where all the cars were and where they got their charge, just about everything you'd like to know but they can't publish that information back to the consumer because the consumer hasn't signed away their location mm -hmm. information. So that's a good example of where the privacy rights thing is sort of, do you really want people to know where you are? Well, what they really want to do long term is they want to take all that machine generated information, they want to be able to publish back to you on your digital screen, you only have 50 miles left on your battery, here are all the charging stations that are within 30 kilometers of where you are, and here are the three restaurants that have an hour free recharge if you stop and have dinner there. So all of a sudden you're combining an entirely new electronic marketplace that will come out of all this big data, an electronic marketplace that both gives you a better benefit, a, a, a monetary benefit, but a co-marketing with the, with the restaurants, movie theaters, shopping centers. Right. There's an entirely new generation of commerce that's going to be created out of this new generation of data. But you have to sign away your privacy rights to get it, or else you can't give it to you. In the case of the Tesla, you're shipping all that data up to them at all times. They know where you are, they know how your car is doing, they know how fast you're driving, they know everything about you, except who's with you in the car. I mean, maybe that's a, they might know that, I don't know. <laughs> 
I haven't checked on that yet. If they do, do you guys know do they, do they know who's? If Never they mind. do, I just decided I'm getting my 16 year old next year a Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to know who's in the car with her, and I want to know where they're at, and uh, they better be moving. So. <laughs> any uh, any questions be before we uh, come to final thoughts? Yes. Yes. So our, I had nothing to do with this. I'd like to take credit for it. But our founders, from the very beginning, felt like viral adoption was an important thing. And they were hoping to create a product that was so targeted towards the end user that they could draw a straight line between the user's pain and the user's solution. So they designed the user. You know, they said, okay, system administrator understands IT operational issues. Give them a user interface that they recognize like a, a natural language of search that kind of looks like the, the, the fields that are inside of a log, sort of a Unix level expression, and a, free, and a downloadable that would auto discover what's on your PC or on your Mac or on your server. And uh, you, the, they wanted to shorten the time between download to aha moment to five minutes. And so that was a key part of the original product design. When you design the product like that, the way you design the executable, makes it not suitable for some other things. So you have to kind of you make compromises about your design, but that was a, a key part of it. They wanted to not do everything that software is accused of doing, which is long-term design cycles, long-term deployment cycles, hard to use, all that sort of thing. And when they were doing the interviewing, pre-version pre one, they asked folks, do you have this problem? And the answer was universally yes. You know, systems fall over or can't find what went wrong. Transaction, transaction goes in one side of the IT blender, never comes out the other side. And, but when they asked them, what software do you like to use? They were surprised that the number one answer was Google. Because it was, even back in 2003, four, the answer was, if I don't know the answer, I'll go up on Google and ask and see if I can find somebody else who does. So it was the ability to query and search was the sort of, that was where the light bulb went on for them. So they basically said, let's put a Google-style interface on top of log files, and off they went. So you know, this whole viral adoption came out of that. It was, if you like to search, then let's give a product that's easy to download and search on and see if we can go from there. And so that was, that was in fact, a very uh, initial design of the product was built to do that. For us, it's worked pretty well just because probably 60 to 70% of the new customers that we acquire every quarter, before we ever got there, there is a handful of people in the company already using it. And a big part of what we do on our go-to-market activities is go find those people and give them a voice. Because they actually know already where the value is in the data and what problem they're able to solve. and what They might not have the political power or the budget or the organizational visibility, but they actually are the heroes that are getting something useful done. So our big part of our go-to-market is just to connect our users with the money. And in our world, the open source champions are often the strongest voice inside of a company. Mm -hmm. So I think it's yeah. the same. Another Whether question? it's free download or, or open source or any of those things, you know, I think all that stuff is useful. I just don't think the world is really in the mood anymore for no. buy millions of dollars worth of enterprise software and spend yep. a couple of years standing it up. All of us who have lived through a couple of SAP installations, you know, shoot, just shoot me if I ever have to do that again. Yeah. Right, we have one more in the back here. Yeah, we do. Uh, we see other solutions that are that are tangential, and we're trying to recruit a partner community to do that. So, to the extent that I use this, you know, Elgin Air Force Base 20,000, uh, you know, building sensors, it's not a business that we know what to do about. We don't know anything about that market, but we found several partners around the world who are specialists at that. They're in the building systems management space. So, if we can give them a tech, the you know underpinnings of a technology for that, and have them go re revolutionize that market by being able to provide immediate time to value, then that's a good combination. So, you know, we'll take any and all ideas for how to partner with other companies to, you know, to, to 
make it happen faster. Yeah. I'll echo that too. I mean, when Godfrey, after we got to know each other a little bit personally and he started to see we had some same customers and brought us in, it was amazing. I mean, it, they have an incredible partner mentality. It's, it's really cool to work with you guys. So one, one final question. We, I Please. saw a hand go up. Yeah. They actually, so if you have a smart card, you know, that you, to access your building or your office, every time you swipe that card onto the sensor that's in the elevator, that the computer that's on the elevator can save that data. So it knows, it knows who came, and it knows when you came, and it knows what suite you're going to because you're an employee of that company. But what if they correlate that with, you said something about Oh, so what they, what they found was that there was a correlation, very strong correlation, between increasing or decreasing foot traffic to, a, to an office, to a suite in the, in the office tower. If foot traffic's going down, that, that lease will not be renewed, the lease, the, 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 the lease for that suite. So it was the direct correlation between foot traffic and whether somebody is going to re-sign their, their, you know, their lease for the space. And kind of like uh, 101 traffic and venture capital. It's ex exactly it's, the same. Could, those, are, those two are highly correlated. I can yeah, tell you that said, right now. They said, so. you know, until machine data came along, they never knew that an elevator was a leading economic indicator. But it is. And it's just like traffic. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, Godfrey, I know how incredibly busy you are, and I cannot thank you enough for coming today. Appreciate Delighted. it very much. So thank Good you very much, you. and uh, thank you guys for coming. Thanks, guys.